and welcome to History Pod, which is being recorded live at the Buxton Festival Fringe in Derbyshire in England. On the 13th of July 1793, the radical French journalist Jean-Paul Marat was stabbed to death in his bathtub by Charlotte Corday. Marat, the second of nine children, had left home at 16 in search of opportunities to pursue his interest in medicine. Having decided to move to northern England in 1770, he settled in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, where he gained a reputation as a highly efficient doctor and also developed an increasing suspicion of the established political order. Marat moved back to France six years later, where his medical skills earned him the patronage of various members of the aristocracy. He used the wealth he earned from this position to establish a scientific laboratory, where he engaged in research regarding fire, heat, electricity and light. He was even visited by the American polymath Benjamin Franklin, but the French Academy of Sciences was sceptical of his conclusions, and relations between Marat and the powerful academy quickly broke down. Despite Marat's wealth and privilege, he maintained his passion for social justice throughout the years preceding the French Revolution. As Louis XVI struggled to secure his rule in the late 1780s, Marat put his scientific and medical career on hold and instead dedicated his time to writing arguments in favour of political, economic and social reform. The collection of his essays is actually upstairs in the history section of this bookshop I noticed yesterday. In the wake of the storming of the Bastille on the 14th of July 1789, he established his own radical newspaper, which soon adopted the translated name, The People's Friend. Marat's writings were vicious in their attacks on all those he perceived as being enemies of the people, by whom he meant the lower classes of the Third Estate. His newspaper often called for violence against the upper class and members of the government, which resulted in him fleeing to London for a few months in early 1790. On his return to Paris, he continued his fierce criticism of the government and even began to target less radical revolutionaries with his call for their execution as enemies of the people. He continued to have to go into hiding on occasion and began to utilise Paris's extensive sewer network where it's believed that he developed the debilitating skin condition that later saw him confined to a medicinal bath for hours on end. Despite his reputation as a radical agitator, Marat was elected to the National Convention in September 1792 where he was a passionate supporter of the decision to declare France a republic. He soon turned his anger on the members of the Girondin component of the National Convention who opposed the execution of the king. Within six months, these moderates had been ousted from the government and Marat turned to working from home due to his worsening skin condition. On the 13th of July 1793, Marat granted an audience to a young woman from Normandy while he soaked in his medicinal bath. The 24-year-old Charlotte Corday claimed to have information about Girondin deputies who had escaped from Paris, and she presented Marat with a list of names of supposed traitors. Corday, however, was actually a Girondin sympathiser. After Marat told her that he would arrange for the execution of the Norman Girondins, she pulled out a five-inch kitchen knife and stabbed him once in the chest, severing a major artery, and causing him to die almost immediately of massive blood loss. Corday was quickly placed on trial and was guillotined in Paris just four days after killing Marat. She claimed in her trial to be a supporter of republicanism, but described Marat as a monster. She explained that she had killed one man to save a hundred thousand, but the assassination contributed to the growing fear of counter-revolution that fuelled the subsequent terror, in which thousands of moderate and conservative French men and women were guillotined on charges of treason. In the immediate aftermath of the murder, Marat was virtually deified by the revolutionaries. At his funeral, the Marquis de Sade, the infamous sexual predator who joined with the most radical elements of the National Convention after being freed from prison, gave the eulogy. It's true. (laughs) Marat's bathtub and the knife that he was killed with were later bought by the Musée Grévin in Paris and are now on display as part of a waxwork scene depicting the assassination, where life becomes art. 
Interestingly, Madame Tussaud's Waxwork Museum had also wanted to buy the bathtub, but their letter got lost in the post and arrived after the sale to the Grevan had already been agreed. Madame Tussauds in London does, however, own the guillotine blade that beheaded the former Queen Marie Antoinette on October the 16th, 1793. The founder of the museum, Marie Tussaud, was a famed wax sculptor before the revolution and had even had her hair cut in preparation for execution during the terror due to her connections to the aristocracy because she went around and made wax portraits of the aristocracy. However, it was then decided that her talents could better serve the revolution, and so she was spared in order to create death masks of the guillotine's many famous victims. And that's where her skills really started to spread into the proletariat. The guillotine is, of course, synonymous with the worst violence of the French Revolution, but the machine was actually created to represent equality. In France, prior to 1789, beheading as a form of execution was reserved exclusively for the nobility. Commoners were usually subjected to considerably longer and much more painful forms of death through hanging or breaking on the wheel or even worse. To end the privilege of the nobility and to bring about equality in death as well as life, the new Revolutionary National Assembly therefore made decapitation the only legal form of execution. It was recognised that manual beheading was, however, still a gruesome way to carry out the death sentence. Mary Queen of Scots, who I mentioned earlier as someone who visited the town of Buxton where we're recording the episode of History Pod, was only beheaded after three blows of the executioner's axe. The Yorkshire town of Halifax had tried to improve the precision of beheadings with the creation of the so-called Halifax gibbet, a guillotine-like machine in which an axe head was fitted to the base of a heavy wooden block that ran in grooves between two tall uprights. It looked very much like a guillotine, but with an axe blade. And that, uh, that was created a whole two centuries before the French came up with the guillotine. But the device, like many things, didn't make it out of Yorkshire. In the face of continued manual beheadings, therefore, on the 10th of October 1789, French physician Joseph Guillotin argued that the new government of France should ensure that every execution was both swift and mechanical. The National Assembly agreed, acknowledging that capital punishment should simply end life, not purposefully cause pain as well. Another physician, Antoine Louis, was appointed to lead a committee to develop a quick and efficient decapitation machine. Although Guillotin was a member of this committee, it's actually therefore Antoine Louis who should be credited with the device's invention, even though it carries Dr Guillotin's name. The first execution using the device was conducted on the 25th of April 1792. Nicolas Jacques Pelletier, a French highwayman found guilty of killing a man during one of his robberies, had the rather dubious honour of being the guillotine's first victim. Contemporary accounts reveal that the execution went smoothly. A little too smoothly, in fact, much to the disappointment of the crowd who expected rather better entertainment. Excited to see this new macabre machine in action, they were disappointed at both its speed and efficiency. Although this was, of course, the whole point. Thank you very much. <laughs>